and I hope there's some overseas guests with us today. This is the second uh, workshop uh, of the London Policing College this year um, and our subject this afternoon is going to be on UK preparedness, particularly looking at the pandemic, um, whether there are lessons to be learned, whether we learnt enough lessons uh, and very timely of course um, with uh, the report being published today on that very subject and I'm sure both our speakers will have something to say on that panel. We're also going to look at, with our second speaker at the, the impact of the voluntary sector in incidents like this and major incidents. So I, I'm delighted we have two speakers for you uh, this afternoon. Uh, Superintendent Hannah Wheeler. Hannah is a serving police officer with the Metropolitan Police with vast experience um, across London, both uniform and CID. Uh, in 2017, Hannah was seconded to HMIC uh, and FRS, I think it is now, though, for those of you who don't know, that's Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary and now Fire and Rescue Service. Um, and last year, Hannah volunteered for and has been part of the UK's Operation Tala, um, the response to the, the, the COVID pandemic, where she's been the national lead for PPE. So I'm sure Hannah's going to be having a lot to say about this subject. Uh, and then if that's not good enough for you, that's going to be followed by Dr Stuart Hyde, uh, a former police officer, incredibly experienced, former Chief Constable of Cumbria, ha had his finger in almost every pie in policing during his service with lots of experience, particularly in this field. But since retirement, has been working in both the voluntary and community sector and has been involved in the response of that sector with such major incidents in the UK as the Grenfell Tower and the Manchester Arena bombing. Um, so two fantastic speakers. Please make use of the chat function. If you've got questions that you want to pose, put them in the chat. Uh, Karen Duckworth, who's facilitating for us this afternoon, will pick up your questions and we'll put them to both Hannah and Stuart and there'll be a chance for you to, to, to come in and ask your questions direct. So we've only got two hours, ladies and gents, so I'm not going to take up any more of our speaker's time. I'm going to hand you over to Hannah for what I hope will be a fascinating two hours. Hannah, over to you, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, Lovely to be here. Thank you very much to the London uh, Policing College for inviting me. Um, I could talk for hours on this subject, so I'm going to uh, to uh, try and rein it in a bit. Um, I've got a PowerPoint uh, presentation to share with you, so bear with me while I just set that up. Hoping this is going to work. Lovely. Can you all see that? Yes. Sir. Can you see the slides underneath it, or is that just me that can see them? No, can just see the front slide. Okay, marvelous, marvelous. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, sort of preparedness, but through the lens of uh, PPE, which is what I've uh, been working on over the past 18 months uh, for policing, and then I'm going to. Um, talk about these sort of opportunities that we've we've built on as a result um, and hopefully then I'll be able to ask you the question as to whether or not um, you feel that we are prepared or not uh, for the future. Um, in terms of whether we were prepared, uh, that's a big question. Um, was the UK prepared is probably a bigger question um, and one that's currently uh, being grappled with at the moment um, in the in the wake of the, of the article being published today or the report. Um, we had to adapt quickly and in a crisis. Um, we thought that uh, the government preparedness had included us um, within that. Uh, that wasn't the case, so we had to put measures in place, which I will go on to uh, describe to you. OK, so the reality, I think, for, for, for me and for, for most of us is that this is what the world has felt like um, for, the past, for the past 18 months. It feels like we've been living in a very sort of strange place. Um, there wasn't enough PPE to start with. Um, the NHS was the government's priority, which is as it should be, uh, but there wasn't enough PPE for us. Um, so we took the decision that um, police would source our own uh, and provide and equip our officers uh, with quality, um, good supplies of PPE. 
OK, so the challenges, uh, numerous challenges, not only in the setting up um, of, um, of of PPE and, and sorting that out, but actually the ongoing challenges. So basically treated this like one long sort of critical incident uh, with lots of other critical incidents happening alongside. So every time kind of thought we were we were getting somewhere, we would be uh, we would be challenged or blindsided by a bit of a curveball that would happen, um, which I shall go on to sort of talk about. Um, but the challenges to start with, um, challenges for everyone, unprecedented um, global public health emergency, uh, global shortage of PPE. Um, I volunteered to go to MPOC, as Bob said, um, asked who the national PPE lead was. Uh, there wasn't one, so I became the national PPE lead. Didn't know anything about medical PPE, um, had to learn quickly about what was required and what was needed. Uh, we hadn't used medical grade PPE in policing before, so there was no sector specific guidance um, from anyone. Uh, there were no common standards or common specifications for the PPE that we needed. Um, there was no sort of blueprint for how to set this up. There was no mobilisation uh, for anything of this, of this sort of uh, stature. Um, the backdrop to that was that forces were were panic buying PPE, they were buying unsuitable PPE because they were just desperate to protect their staff, which I totally understand. Um, but we needed we needed to, to make sure that everyone was protected properly. Um, there was no funding uh, available, there was no finance in place uh, and there was no funding forthcoming from the government. Um, no common IT platforms at all, no common sort of comm structure um, and no data at all. Uh, in existence um, to base any kind of benchmarking against about what we might need. Um, so tackle this as a, as a problem to be solved um, using national decision making model. You know, what have we got? What are the issues? Um, what are our options? Um, so one of the first things we well had to do was just set out at our mission. And the mission has always been from the start. Um, we needed to save lives. We needed to save and protect our officers so that they could protect the communities they serve and also go home to their families and, and not infect them with COVID as well. So that was our absolute crucial mission. Um, and when we were having particularly difficult, uh, difficult days when we were trying to secure uh, PPE, this was what uh, we came back to time after time was that we had to save lives. So the first thing I had to do was um, assemble a team. So assemble a sort of virtual team. Um, this was difficult. I'd, I'd arrived at MPOC. Um, I hadn't worked there before. Um, so I had to, using the network that I had from HMIC, um, sort out people that could help me around the country with expertise. Um, Thames Valley Police stepped up very kindly. Uh, their procurement and finance lead was excellent. Um, so he kind of kept me on the straight and narrow. Had to get in a contract management expert from the Forensic Capability Network. Um, forces and our stakeholders were very were very keen to supply people that, that could help us, but we had to keep a very sort of small team. When we'd looked at the amount of um, PPE that would be required in policing, we realised that we would need um, somewhere vast to store it, so a kind of central warehousing uh, or distribution hub. Um, so we looked at uh, where was sort of geographically the best place to put that um, near to an airport. Um, we, uh, we knew at the time that, that Heathrow would be probably the only airport that was going to be available. So if we needed PPE flown in, we needed to be close to it. Um, so Thames Valley um, identified that they had um, a hangar on the old um, Upper Hayford base uh, that they were able to lend us. Um, and also agreed to lend us a team um, of their, their planning team, planning and events team, because events had obviously stopped because of COVID. Um, because we hadn't done this before, I put a request into the military, um, as they are the, the logistics experts and the Royal Logistic Corps took up the challenge um, and arrived very quickly at Upper Hayford and were there for, for two weeks um, with my five officers, um, training them up, setting up the system we've got now, um, and mentoring them and then they then left after two weeks to go and 
to go and help elsewhere during the pandemic. But they established the, the facility that we've got now. And that has been um, that has been an absolute godsend because we needed somewhere very, very large to take in the amounts of PPE that we were going to be needing. Um, people have been, you know, the, the kind of main the main asset of this, really, just the, the brilliant people that have stepped forward to help. Uh, we needed to develop guidance, um, so reached out to various different stakeholders, um, Public Health England, um, SAGE, Defence Science and Technology Lab, um, Health and Safety Leads, the staff associations and senior leads in policing to form a really, a really good sort of uh, guidance review team as well, so that we could oversee what guidance we needed um, based on, you know, really good um, up-to-date scientific information from the government. So this, I don't know if you can see it, this is um, this is some pictures from from the, um, the PPE hub, um, and this is this is it actually when it wasn't that full. It has been absolutely uh, packed to the packed to the gunnels. But unless you've actually seen it, it's um, it's it's quite something. I know when boxes of PPE arrive in forces, uh, they don't see the kind of front end that actually gets it delivered there uh, and that's my team in the top right um, i've nominated them for a, a award from the national police Wellbeing service which they won uh, for responding in a crisis uh, that excellent team have um, basically packed and unpacked and delivered ppe to the whole of policing for the past 18 months um, so they have done an absolutely excellent job So one of the things I wanted to focus on um, was the purchase of PPE because I know it's it's been an issue from the start um, and there was a report actually last week about um, the issues that the government have had to do with PPE purchase um, and monies spent um, and sort of intermediaries that have been involved in actually sorting out that um, purchase of, of PPE. Um, so when at the very start, uh, we realised that the government weren't able to provide us with uh, PPE. Um, they were unable at that time to provide um, you know, the care, care homes and also the NHS. So that had to be their first priority. We decided that we would do it ourselves. We'd go it alone. Um, we had to do, we had to be completely transparent about this. We were spending, well, spending public funds that we hadn't even got possession of. Um, so we went to our trusted suppliers into policing, um, so suppliers that had previously supplied uh, supplied body armour, things like that. They hadn't supplied uh, medical grade PPE to us before, um, but they were trusted long term suppliers into policing and they did their very best to um, source and try and track down PPE for us that was of um, a suitable quality um, and we could trust them and we had the kind of finance um, streams in the uh, the kind of mechanism to pay them. I won't say the finance because we didn't have that, but the mechanism to pay them. And where we ran out of trusted supplies, we then went to um, the, the medical health registered authorities um, to try and get PPE from them as well. Um, we didn't have um, any funding. We didn't have any funding at all to do this. Um, the Home Office and Cabinet Office work on a um, will reimburse you later um, basis, but actually we needed to have money up front and payment up front because this was a very scarce commodity um, and we were placing orders over the phone that had to be fulfilled within an hour or two before another, um, before somebody else came and swooped that, that, that order away. So payment was required um, immediately. Um, we didn't have, we didn't use any intermediaries to do this, we just had my sort of team team of two and then with me kind of overseeing it and on the first um, first day actually I had to write the biggest IOU on behalf of policing uh, because we needed to get urgent PPE so we actually sourced a dental warehouse that had um, had masks and gloves and because dentists had shut down because of Covid um, I managed to do a, a deal where we would take their PPE off their hands um, but say so I had to do a, an IOU to them um, and promised that I would pay the following week. Um, so it was it was um, done a lot on uh, trust. Um, in terms of finance, what we had to do was uh, approach uh, each force uh, and ask them if they would pay for PPE. Um, 
Not all forces wanted to, some were very forthcoming, some weren't, uh, and this wasn't a quick process. Uh, you'll know anything to do with procurement or, or finance generally has to go through quite a few processes and takes a few days, whereas we were needing that finance uh, in a matter of sort of minutes and hours. So drew up, I drew up a short list of forces that I could go to where we, I had pre-agreed with them that they would, they would um, finance um, PPE. So they would essentially buy and place an order for us once I'd put the, the, uh, the mechanism in place. Um, so 15 forces stepped up to, to pay for PPE on behalf of National Policing um, to the tune of £40 million. Um, they've since been reimbursed by the Home Office, but they didn't know at the time they were going to be. Um, I'd had a verbal undertaking from the Policing Minister, uh, Kit Malthouse, that forces would be reimbursed. But again, everything was so, uh, so dynamic at the start, we didn't know when this was going to happen. Um, so we had to reassure forces that we were still buying to best value, we were still spending public money, um, had to make a very uh, quick decision early on that I would um, source and procure different types of masks so that we would deconflict with the NHS. They desperately needed um, a grade of mask called an FFP3, which is the highest grade. Um, so I deliberately chose to, to procure an FFP2, which is ever so slightly um, less but it made it made all the difference to the actual supply chains that we were able to access and didn't compromise the, um, the NHS. Um, the other issues we had with with PPE were that we were buying just one size fits all. Um, we know that's that's not ideal. Um, PPE doesn't fit everyone. Um, but actually, once um, I've looked into it, um, PPE is, is um, despite being used in hospitals, it is still very much based on a um, on basically masks that miners wore. Um, if any of you have read the, the book by Caroline Criado Perez on sort of data bias, um, masks are still very much biased towards male faces. Uh, and that's a piece of work that we're actually working on um, now with a university to try and uh, develop and, and um, source different size masks for, for different people. But that's, a, that's a sort of another piece of work really. But um, but the PPE purchasing was was difficult. Um, we had to say we've got we had to keep all the receipts. We had to have a very clear audit trail of what we'd purchased. Sometimes the kit that we purchased would arrive and it wouldn't be the right kit. Uh, it would have the wrong certification. Um, certification for PPE changed halfway through the pandemic. Um, so we had to we had to make allowances for that. To try and understand that get a rep from the British Safety Industry Federation and the Health and, Self Health and Safety Executive involved on our, on our uh, review team to check that we were, we were doing everything right. Um, so that was, that was one of the challenges. Another challenge at, at the height of the pandemic was that the Health and Safety Executive uh, made a decision to recall um, all types of KN95 masks, which are a, um, an Asian brand of FFP3. And they were, they were in the NHS. We had some as well, um, but they all had to be withdrawn and quarantined and backfilled with um, with different types of mask. So there were all these sort of challenges happening um, throughout. Once we thought we'd kind of settled and and got um, PPE organised, you know, another curveball would come in. So it's been it's been a fascinating journey. Um, so these are just kind of a canter through the numbers for you. So. In my, the article that I wrote, I'd said it was over 80 million items, um, but actually since I wrote that, um, we've re-totted it up um, and actually it's over 300 million items of PPE um, shipped to forces from our PPE hub. Um, 40 million pounds spent on PPE by 15 forces out of the 43. Um, it's just five police officers at the hub that have done all the work and, and processed over 3,000 tonnes of PPE. Uh, with over 6,000 pallets of good goods processed um, and we're currently on our 12th version of PPE guidance. Um, not ideal, normally when you issue guidance it's, uh, it kind of stays uh, in date or is reviewed every six months but with the with the ever-changing dynamic of this, um, this sort of Covid pandemic we've had to be really alive to what we've been learning around um, infection prevention control um, and how the virus spreads and develop our uh, our 
uh, guidance accordingly. So innovation. So we've managed. Um, I feel quite proud of the fact we've managed. We have managed to innovate um, throughout this. This was from a standing start. This none of this existed uh, before. So in order to track all the PPE that uh, we were getting delivered into the hub and then delivering out to forces, we needed um, a digital solution. So we developed our own PPE dashboard that all the forces are on so we know how much PPE they've got in the force, how much is on the way to them in transit, how much we have at the hub, and also how much they are using on a daily basis. So their usage and consumption of each item. And it was through this process at the height of the pandemic that we were able to identify that actually forces were or officers and, and staff were struggling a bit with what we termed PPE fatigue, um, which was when I thought that we were going to be needing more PPE, the requirement actually dropped. Um, so commissioned some research by Cardiff University into uh, what the barriers to wearing PPE were and what the behaviours were that were leading to this and what we could do to improve improve our response to that. So that has been really useful. That's now uh, been adopted by um, the policing sort of new contract company called Blue Light Commercial. So they they um, they're using that now to track PPE across forces and giving that information as well to Department of Health and Social Care. So that's been that's been fantastic. Uh, the PPE guidance um, developed from what was a written document to uh, a table with designs and pictures of what the, the PPE looked like to a now interactive um, dashboard version that you click through and you can see what PPE you need to be wearing on which scenario. And we've developed it to include uh, roadside breath testing scenarios, um, custody, public order, protest. So all sorts of things that's developed throughout. Uh, we've developed um, a PPE specification document with the health and safety teams around um, future purchase and what suppliers need um, need what they actually need to order on our behalf that wasn't in existence so we had to develop that uh, so we now have that in place um, we needed to do a quality assurance statement for all forces um, because their health and safety leads understandably were quite anxious about all this PPE arriving in force without them having their own kind of um, processes in place to assure it quality assure it so I did a an overall blanket one for them we developed a digital inventory system for the for the PPE hub. Um, so every product that comes in is is quality assured, is registered, is logged uh, with the expiry dates. There's also pictures taken of it. Uh, so we know what we've got coming in. We know what we've got going out. We've got our own uh, cloud based certification database. So every item can be checked against the certificate. Um, we had trouble when we moved across actually to getting PPE from DHSC because they didn't have that in development and they couldn't supply us with the certificates so we're helping them um, you know with with how we've developed ours um, we've got our own mailbox into Optala um, and flowchart process for forces to follow to, to place their PPE orders as I referenced earlier we've got the, uh, the behavioral research study and we also set up our own operation Tala uh, ethics committee because this has been so new um, all of this for policing it is presented some some really ethical challenges and ethical dilemmas um, so we've had a broad spe spectrum of people from outside policing mulling over these issues with us not just PPE um, but uh, protest travel regulations vaccination testing um, so that has been that has been one of um, one of the sort of highlights for me really key learning point And now the question, um, are we prepared? Are we prepared for the future? Are we prepared for another pandemic? Um, I think so, but I will leave it. I'll leave it to you to to, uh, to quiz me on that at the end. But um, so as you'll be aware, the government had a, a pandemic stockpile um, for this eventuality. Um, it turned out to be not always fit for purpose. Some of the kit in it had expired. Uh, it, they couldn't get it uh, to where it needed to be quick enough. Um, so we now have our own uh, pandemic 
um, PPE strategic reserve for policing and we've got that um, we've got that six weeks um, PPE in every line that we provide so we provided 10 10 lines of PPE uh, 10 items so we've got six week reserve now for for the whole of policing so that in the future should what happened in March happen again we don't have that mad scramble at the start with with people not having PPE so everyone will have PPE until we get those uh, supply chains in place. Now, towards the end of last year, Department of Health and Social Care actually uh, were able to start supplying us with PPE. Um, so sort of August time, they were able to start um, supplying PPE. They couldn't supply it direct into forces because their, um, their, um, their systems weren't sort of mature enough to take on that many different um, different places to deliver to at any one time. So DHSC delivered into the hub and then forces came to collect their PPE from us. But now, nearly a year on, DHSC have set up an online portal, which each force has transitioned across to, which is a bit like a, an Amazon cart where they go in and order their, their PPE from now. Um, so we're hoping that that's going to be um, a situation that continues for the future. Um, however, there is every chance that should a pandemic hit again that 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 supply of PPE may be cut off to policing uh, we did have to hand over all our supplies to the government when they were when they were struggling and they also redirected some of the supplies and orders that we'd already placed um, to move them into the NHS so um, I'm alive to the fact that you know it's it's not always as a as a robust a system as we think it is, what we've got in place could just be you know taken away at a moment's notice. Um, we've got ongoing review and development of our sector specific PPE guidance now. That's in place. Um, that will be in place for the foreseeable. Um, it's a very user friendly guidance, and we're now adapting different documents at MPOC to follow that same kind of style, where you can press through and see the documents that you need um, with the up to date links on. Um, we've got a blueprint now and a process map for any future mobilisation of a distribution hub for any reason. So that's in place. Uh, we're future proofing the PPE programme and embedding all the lessons learned within policing. And they're going to sit within the civil contingencies portfolio and also the CBRN portfolio. Um, so CBRN, so our sort of um, nuclear kind of I say nuclear kind of people that react in in the event of, of a, a nuclear spill or or something contagious they have um, PPE to a degree so I'm hoping that our PPE within the strategic reserve can be put onto their asset register and and owned by them in the event of of needing it in the future so you know embedding this these systems and processes where they can be accessed really quickly we're doing ongoing winter scenario planning with the Home Office. Uh, we've now got a national chief scientific officer for policing, uh, which we didn't have before, um, and he will become the new national PPE lead. And he will be in those meetings that uh, we should have probably been in at the start with um, with SAGE and with the with the government officials and with Professor Whitty and um, Professor Jonathan Van Tam and, and Patrick Valance. So we need to be represented um, as an organisation at that level to be involved in those conversations. So we will be in the future and we're also appointing a chief, a national police chief medical officer as well, because there are lots of uh, medical and health issues that affect all of policing you know, and fire and rescue and everyone. Um, but some of them are quite unique to policing. And again, we need to be represented at, at those um, at those meetings. So Blue Light Commercial, as I mentioned earlier, the company that um, has been set up by the, um, the Office for Police and Crime Commissioners to run the contract contract management for policing. So they don't just deal with the PPE, they deal with all our assets and fleet and everything. So they now own our digital dashboard um, and they will look to replicate that across policing for different um, assets so that they can track them and track the usage and consumption and and rag rating of when when things need replacing and we've also negotiated with the um, the MPCC finance lead to have a finance stream in place for sort of in extremist purchasing um, because we really we didn't have that at all and we really needed it um, 
and that was something that it was just so important to have and it will be important to have for the future should anything similar occur um it's it's difficult to ask people to to pay up front for something um a couple of the forces that did purchase ppe for us uh, took out loans so they've been paying interest on the loans that they took out to help um, national policing so um so we've put that in place now so we're hoping that um, with all these things that are now going to sit within our civil contingencies portfolio that will be will be a lot um, will be a lot better placed to to be prepared in the future and so just to finish i just wanted to finish with one of my favorite quotes uh, and just a picture of the, the hangar where kind of all the magic happened and all the ppe was stored um, and moved in and out of um, things do always seem impossible until they're done um, and because we didn't think too hard about what we were trying to achieve at the start I think that's how we were able to overcome and just work through because we did hit challenge after challenge and we just had to keep calm and just keep going again to find a way around some of these um, some of these very very complex issues that we were trying to resolve um, so that's my presentation, Karen. I hope I've kept to time. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you ever so much. That's fascinating. And I'm very interested there to hear about the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer of Policing. I mean, that's a very significant step forward, isn't it, in terms of looking yeah. forward? Yeah. Um, so just a couple of questions from the chat, Hannah. Um, mm. One from Dean, Dean Andrews. Did you find that having to work dynamically from scratch that although you had to have an audit trail that the bureaucracy was minimal or was it as he says an admin nightmare um interestingly at the very start it was quite a breath of fresh air that the the bureaucracy just wasn't there because people were off doing other things that would normally sometimes put those levels of bureaucracy in place um and in fact my job when i got to mpoc i was just so told by by my boss they'd sort sort ppe out um make the decisions so i was making very very high level decisions and then kind of checking in and going oh this is okay i've said police will go it alone he's like yes fine just do it just do it so there was so much going on um there was a lot of trust um but yeah we did a lot of hurdles that we would have had to go through things like the tendering process um that that was dismantled for the purposes of this because we were in an emergency so we didn't have to go through tender processes and get quotes and things it was literally we were on the phone till late at night <laughs> ringing china and ringing suppliers going can we have this can we have that so in a way that bureaucracy was moved out of the way but we did have to be really careful um, about keeping and uh, keeping an audit trail of the emails i've got policy logs um with with millions of entries in um, every day, you know, decisions I made of the context around those decisions, because some of them looking back on it, you make a decision one day and the next day. The, the landscape completely changes, um, you know, yesterday I could order one type of mask tomorrow. They might be, you know, you know, we're not using them in policing. So it was very, very dynamic, but just, you know, I had to keep yeah, an audit trail. We had to keep um, very close eye on doing due diligence on our suppliers we had to do that very very quick time which is why we stuck to trusted suppliers i was contacted by a lot of people wanting to sell ppe into policing um they were very persistent um but i you know i'm not in a position to buy off people i don't know i had to go down the route of of trusted suppliers because we needed that assurance so in terms of bureaucracy like that i suppose a, a little bit of it but actually a lot of it fell away and it was only actually when when um when the world started to try and get back to normal that bureaucracy kind of kicked in again so certain things i was able to do during a complete crisis then had to be <laughs> sent through a couple of layers of bureaucracy when people had returned to work so um yeah it was it was interesting i hope that answers your question <laughs> Okay, um, oh yeah, it did. Thank you very much. Um, Tyler's interested in your system for managing the enormous demand from distribution, and I know you set up a, a system pretty much from scratch. Um, is, is that system, now that it's pretty much embedded, something that can be considered 
useful across other pieces of work that have developed out of this initial piece of work? Yes, and I think I think because we didn't have any data and we didn't know what the demand was at, at the start because we didn't know uh, it wasn't they weren't items that had been used in policing before. We were starting from scratch, so we were able to build systems that we wanted and, and worked for us. Um, and we've been able to sort of develop them and, and fine tune them. Um, so, but the, say the, the caveat on that, I would say, is that our systems are only as good as, as the information that we're given by forces. And some forces keep better records than others. Um, I'll probably touch on it, you know, a bit later. But it's it was very difficult dealing with 43 forces plus the non-home office forces, devolved governments. Um, overseas dependencies who all operate completely differently and who have different levels of bureaucracy and things and working out what their demand is and what they need, um, what they were already using, um, that was tricky. So, um, and it's that's still very, very challenging. Um, but yes, this, I'm confident that what we've got in place now can be, can be a blueprint for all sorts of different things in policing. Um, because uh, we we say we had it rag rated and it was only when we started to notice a, a drop in um, usage of PPE. It was at the end of the first lockdown last year. I expected the use of PPE to go up once lockdown finished because officers and staff will be coming into contact with more public. Um, but the opposite happened and it was just they were tired of wearing it. Um, it's hard work doing a long shift wearing PPE constantly. Um, so we had to rethink our approach in terms of our communications. Um, and really sort of re reinstill in them the importance of, of wearing it. But um, we've, we have, I think we've got very good data now. So say a little bit of a caveat with what forces tell us, but we, I know to the absolute last box of gloves, what we've had in and out of, of, the, um, of the hub. So, um, yeah. Okay, fabulous, thank you. And question from Shell. What lessons can we all learn from the experience of cross-agency working we can take forward into future national crisis planning events? And I'm sure Stuart is going to touch on this as well in a moment. Yeah, I think he is. Really good question. Thanks, Shell. All been good questions. Um, Shell, I must just say, was instrumental at the start in helping me um, <laughs> helping me gain military support. At the very start of this, Shell was embedded into to Operation Tala and she's been fantastic. Um, so Shelley's probably one of the best people to about cross agency working. Um, I think the lessons we can learn are to to be kind to each other, to understand that people operate differently under stress. Um, and, and some police are used to operating in a crisis. Other other organisations and stakeholders probably aren't. Um, other organisations and stakeholders have different objectives that they want to get out of things. So it's always important to understand that you're talking about the same aim and objective when you start to do something and agree what outcomes you want as well um, before you work together. But definitely, I would say one of the one of the important things and I, I've, if I've thought this before the pandemic actually is, is building those relationships with um, with other people kind of during peacetime when things aren't in a crisis. So taking the time to have those conversations with people and building up that respect and trust between organisations um, and partners so that in an emergency, you can just pick up the phone and go, right, this is what we're doing. This is what we need. This is how we're going to do it. Um, and it's and it's more you're more likely to, to to be successful, I think. And in, interestingly enough, um, when I, I went to the hub, um, last week because it's closing down um you know we're finally sort of putting the strategic stock away and, and closing down because forces are getting their stock from dhsc um, actually the procurement lead was saying because we're now getting free ppe from department of health and social care those sort of trusted suppliers that did us so well during the pandemic kind of twiddling their thumbs a bit so he's been meeting with them um and just you know talking and keeping you know kind of keeping them warm for the next time that we, we will in you know inevitably need to to, to seek supplies from them or, or maybe different things even um so it yeah for me it's about it's about keeping those those relationships alive and and kind of warm um, um yeah and, and being 
being contactable um, and approachable. OK, lovely. And just one more question before we close um, this part of the, the workshop. How did you manage competing priorities of forces against the requirements that you're trying to drive? So you mentioned that you were on version 12 of the PPE guidance, mm. and yet for some forces on a day to day basis, just managing the changes in the COVID guidance and how that how their officers delivered that, managing simple response times, getting people yeah. in the right place at the right time is was probably problematic enough. Um, how did you manage those competing demands? Um, again, I, I mean, I, as an operational officer, I, I have every sympathy. I don't know how forces and officers and staff have, have coped with the deluge of information that, that has come out. Um, the importance of national um, coordination is has been absolutely key to this. And I think all forces have, have realised that, you know, the, the benefit of it. Um, but trying to communicate with all forces and making sure that that communication lands in force then goes where it needs to in forces as well because they are set up so differently and operate differently that has been really challenging and it, it continues to be so ensuring that forces have got the most up-to-date information so um, at the start of the, the pandemic I ran weekly pulse surveys through the federation just to check whether forces were getting the PPE whether they were happy with it whether they they, were, they could understand it whether they understood the guidance um, and interestingly, sometimes they, they would come back and go, we haven't got any PPE. I go, well, I know we delivered, you know, stacks of it last last week. So I then knew that it was an, it was an operational issue logistics wise once it was in the force as opposed to an error at our end. But it's important not to ever assume you know where the, the issues are until you've looked into it, because, um, yeah, certain challenges have, have arisen that you would never say have, have foreseen. But it, it's it's been hugely challenging trying to communicate to different audiences so I've presented to chiefs council um, to speak to the chiefs directly because I get lots of messages from forcing or well, the chief said this or our SLT have said that um, but we know you've said this we've run uh, knowledge sharing events um, on a regular basis sort of on a on a monthly basis with the college so that new um, and occurring issues that, that have arisen, we get to, to talk about them straight away while they're sort of live for the forces so we can give them information straight away. We've had them on, uh, say, regulations on um, crime. We've also had them on long COVID, testing, vaccination, PPE and PPE guidance. Um, so it's just keeping people involved um, and inviting key, your key people in force that you can track down that you know understand what you're talking about and then getting them to be that person in force that then sort of promulgates all that information that you're sending. Um, it is difficult though because there is obviously rotation in, in forces and people were getting burnt out sort of the COVID leads in forces and they were changing um, and I would know when a force COVID leader changed because I would get the same lot of questions in that I got at the start of the pandemic kind of a year later. <laughs> Um, so it would be someone new kind of going, why are we doing this? You know, what, what's what's PPE guidance, you know? And so things weren't landing where they should, but it's just trying to get, get in everywhere I could. College of Policing, staff associations have been amazing. So I speak to, I had an embedded uh, federation rep that I spoke to, and I still speak to on a daily basis, but I was speaking several times a day to him, probably for most of last year. I meet with all the staff association reps on a weekly basis. Um, so that they can tell me what the issues are in force and I can check with them that what we've sending out is has landed and whether it's landed in the way it was intended. Um, so yeah, it's been challenging. Okay, well that's, we'll, we'll, we'll hang on there. Thank you ever so much. Absolutely fascinating insight into your world for the last 18 months. Um, Stuart, can we hand over to you? Um, you can talk us through your last 12 to 18 months <laughs> with the voluntary sector. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, uh, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, uh, really informative. Thanks very much indeed. I'm just going to uh, try and share my screen. Uh, where's it gone? It's not letting me at the moment. Hang on. Uh, here we go. 
Okay. Can you all see the screen now? Yeah, that's fine, Stuart. Excellent. Okay. I'm talking today about the mobilising the power of kindness, um, the voluntary sector and, and what it's done throughout COVID. Um, but in order to do that, I need to just go back into just a little bit of history in order to um, dis describe what occurred uh, during COVID. So I'm going to go back to 2017, which for the majority of the, certainly the large um, voluntary organisations within the UK um, was a massive change uh, for them. Most of you will remember the various uh, disasters that occurred, uh, Grenfell Fire, the Manchester Arena, terrorist attacks, and of course the annual flooding that takes place, all of which caused major chaos to people, huge investigations, sadly um, tragic loss of life. Um, but what they all involved was mobilisation of the voluntary sector. People have different views about what the voluntary sector is. Some people think, well, it's just a, a bunch of people that will come along and sort of, you know, hand out uh, sweets and chocolates or they'll, they'll, they'll um, provide blankets for, for people that need them. And people have rather bizarre views about what the voluntary sector is. What it is, is, is a huge number of people across the country, um, many of which are highly skilled, highly trained and resourced and ready to go to help in, in relation to emergencies in, in any crisis whatsoever. So during 2017 and these crises, a number of issues came out, particularly for the Grenfell fire, but not necessarily, and, and including the Manchester Arena and some of the terrorist attacks plus uh, the flooding. And those issues were things like, for example, at Grenfell, um, the ability of charities to work together to coordinate, consolidate things and to be able to understand what each other could do. Uh, there were other issues. Again, at Grenfell, there was a teacher that put up a um, a, a charity fund for the fire and within a week had raised somewhere in the region of a million and a half, um, which I don't know if you've ever actually seen a million pounds or you've dealt with a million pounds. It's a lot of money and requires an enormous amount of management just to spend it. And of course, um, having raised that money, uh, being considered a charity almost immediately and having to comply with the rules and regulations of the Charity Commission. Some of the other things that occurred, a lot of people turned up to help and volunteers vo or volunteering organisations, charities were asked, well, how do you actually manage all these people that just turn up? How do you know that they're genuine people with a real need and that they've got the skills that they they say they have or that they're just, a, a, for want of a better term, uh, people off the street who have got all sorts of different private and personal or even political agendas um, or even that they're there in order to steal? You only have to do a quick search on Grenfell Fire and Fraud on Google and you'll see just how much money um, was stolen from the public who had donated money to help uh, in the aftermath of Grenfell. So there were there were a lot of issues um, floating around. Not least of all, going back to the appeals from Grenfell, um, the number of appeals that were in place and the number of different systems of how you could get money out. So the Charity Commission in its um, using its convening powers basically said to the sector, look, you have got to change the way in which you deal with crises. At the moment, you're a bit dysfunctional. You're not linked. You're not joined up. It's not in the best interest of the uh, public. And it certainly is not in the best interest of charities to be so disorganised. And some of the uh, commentary was quite scathing, although it's accepted that the vast majority of people who gave up their time, energy or were professionals within the voluntary sector uh, were, were doing a really good job. So uh, the Charity Commission, using its uh, uh, convening powers, called together 
charities, uh, mostly chief executive officers, the most senior people in each charity, people like Red Cross, St. John, um, uh, Volunteering Matters, organisations that actually represent lots of smaller charities, um, uh, NAVCA, and I'll mention them a, a bit later on, uh, Salvation Army and some of the religious charities and faith groups as well, brought them together in London and I was asked to uh, facilitate them and come up with a plan of how we could address all this criticism. Um, and what we came up with was a four-pronged plan and this will become quite relevant as we go towards COVID. So what the uh, CEOs agreed was that they needed to find a way in which charities could respond um, together much better in collaboration and in cooperation. That they could also ensure that in the aftermath of the immediate needs of a crisis, they could start working on a recovery scheme together in conjunction with a whole range of different organisations, whether it's through a local resilience forum or um, uh, through a health board or, or just through local authority. They also needed to find a way of sharing information. One of the surprising things I found when I first started doing this work was that many of the CEOs didn't actually know each other. Um, uh, they, they, they'd not worked in the same thing and yet each person and each individual member of each um, charity like, like Red Cross or St. John had a huge commitment to those organisations, massive brand loyalty amongst their staff and their volunteers and almost to the exclusion of everybody else. And so there wasn't a lot of work going on between um, different charities and that's what we set to, to try and change. We also wanted to ensure that where funds are raised, it's raised properly, um, it's raised professionally, and it's raised safely and securely so that fraud could not take place, that there was a proper oversight with people who knew what they were doing, um, and that they were able to organize themselves um, professionally through a proper charity. And it's no good if you've raised a load of money, if you then cannot distribute that money to those in need, um, whether it's humanitarian assistance or, or, or other beneficiaries, um, in a way that's fair, socially acceptable, legal, and that's a very important part of this, and retains the support of the public because you won't go for the second appeal if your first appeal has been a complete disaster and is seen as a fraud. So all of these things, big global national issues, certainly big national issues for the UK. Um, and then as um, Hannah raised earlier, the, the challenge of dealing with all those issues across the uh, uh, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, all of which had different bits of how they how they manage themselves uh, and different legislation. So I'm going to talk first and foremost about the fund raising and fund distribution. Uh, some of you may have heard of the organisation called the Disasters Emergency Committee. This was set up about 50 years ago to allow the large charities, um, Crisis, uh, Children's Aid, um, uh, Red Cross, people that provide emergency response to other countries abroad internationally uh, and work together. They set up this uh, charity, Disasters Emergency Committee, and the 13 uh, members of that, if there is a crisis, whether it's a, a tsunami or a flooding, uh, will work together to, to have one appeal for all of the charities that they will all focus on and try and use that one appeal to raise money. So when there is a disaster, you'll see deck posters everywhere. Um, you'll see adverts on television and that works really well. However, that charity only operates outside the UK and it's specifically set up to do that. And many of the organizations only operate outside the UK. So it, it wasn't thought that this would they could take on the role of, of something that occurs within the UK. So we established the National Emergencies Trust, um, set it up and we managed to be able to uh, get uh, Lord Richard Dannett, 
um, who used to be in charge of the army, and uh, and there were lots and lots of uh, supporters for him. Uh, he is the independent chair of the Emergencies Trust. It's an independent charity. Oh, um, sorry, Matt, I've just gone into a conference. And, and he is um, uh, responsible for, for driving it. His experience is through Help for Heroes. So he knows what he's doing. He's uh, a, an amazing person for opening doors. And of course, as head of our, as the previous head of army, he's got access to lots of things and lots of people. So during um, the crisis with COVID, the National Emergencies Trust set up its very first national appeal within the UK, and it does cover all of the devolved nations as well. Um, because it had set in motion lots of relationships with industry and with different businesses, and had secured match funding through the government, it actually raised in, in, the, in the region of a hundred million pounds, just short of a hundred million. Uh, during the uh, in in uh, 2020, the first part of the crisis. Now, in order to ensure that that money is shared properly, it, it's used the um, uh, UK uh, Community Foundation, which take which it exists in every region of the UK as a responsible organisation to ensure fair distribution. So where I live in West Yorkshire, the, the uh, Community Foundation here uh, managed uh, uh, requests and distribution. So it met both needs, proper fundraising, organised fundraising using really good people and getting um, an awful lot of money together and an equitable, fair, safe and legal process to distribute it. And it did all that with a, a, a cost of about one to two percent uh, in order to do that, which which actually in comparison with many, many charities is peanuts. So it's run on a shoestring. Um, however, in order to ensure that it's not just a sort of a one horse pony, it, it's just sort of done one crisis and that's it. It's established now, and whenever there's an emergency on top of COVID, it looks at whether it should set up an appeal. It also has a um, an exercise every three months to ensure that the board, who now consists of a lot of very independent people, um, not necessarily linked to any specific charity, um, can make decisions. And I've acted as a various police functions in those exercises, which have been good and which have been highly professional and, and very well run. So that's the, the fundraising raising and distribution side and how that changed um, for uh, COVID within the voluntary sector. There's 13,000 individual small charities that have benefited from that 100 million. The money wasn't just sort of collected and then handed over to the large organisations like St John Evidence, Red Cross, um, Salvation Army. The vast majority of it went to very small local charities, whether they're sort of community assistance charities um, or, or, or local faith-based groups making small donations that were needed in order to keep those charities going uh, during um, uh, COVID. And many of them were very, very grateful for the money received. So in relation to the first two aspects of this, response and recovering information, the voluntary sector uh, was able to secure some funding from government. Um, it, was, it was only about five million, which in relation to the cost of uh, uh, COVID is absolute peanuts. However, it did enable the, the um, sector to create uh, what is now called the, the VCS Emergencies Partnership. We had established a group since 2019 amongst the CEOs of the sector. And in fact, the Whaley Bridge Dam um, flooding or near flooding that occurred in, in late 20, 2019 um, was managed by this group. But all we had available to us was essentially a, a member of staff and uh, a WhatsApp group, but nonetheless, 
the partnership did work and charities worked together. However, it, it wasn't very good in providing uh, information or insight uh, as, as we went through. So um, as we came into COVID, we then had to create a structure. In order to create a structure, we had the um, uh, a, a whole range of charities that donated people. Um, we had to create a structure, and in order to do that, we had to have names of things. So we created five tactical, uh, five uh, regional cells, and we each one we were able to buy in um, strategic engagement managers who were responsible for talking and working with local charities um, across their region. So we had, um, particularly for England, um, North. Uh, South East, South West, London and um, Midlands and the East. Wales had a separate system, Scotland had one and so did Northern Ireland. But what we did for the first time was actually share information or insight as it's uh, referred to. Um, and for the first time, using the IT facilities of Red Cross uh, and sharing it with charities across the country, um, we were able to ensure that um, where there was an identified need that was not being met, we could share that out to different charities and ensure that people were able to help out. Um, we established, uh, again, through Red Cross's IT, but supported by a whole range of other uh, charity people, a request for support system so that individuals or charities could put in a request to say, I'm, I'm really looking for um, this type of facility. A good example of this, um, in Halifax, uh, there were a number of people engaged in the asylum system uh, who, who didn't meet the coverage for any of the other funds in order to get um, uh, electronic devices, computers, laptops, tablets, mobile phones for their young people so that they could continue education as, as the schools have been uh, closed down. Through the um, uh, stakeholder groups, we were able to identify a business in the community, which is the, the, the business's uh, charity, for want of a better term, and they were able to come up with the goods. So that, that gave us um, the, the opportunity to identify somebody that could meet those needs. Um, of course, all these terms that we had, uh, regional stakeholder, stakeholder engagement managers, tactical, it was all new language to most of the charity sector and actually having to write um, job descriptions, uh, purpose descriptions for each of the groups was was quite good fun to say the least. Um, but because we had access to a whole range of uh, charities, HR, finance and other people, they all gave up their time to do it properly. So what the partnership ended up with and what it has now is an effective system to share information, data, uh, intelligence or insight about what's going on in the country, about what capabilities there are for uh, people and um, uh, for each charity so we know who can provide the most cars, who can provide various other aspects or, or facilities that might be needed, particularly food. Um, we were also able to identify, for example, the number of schools that needed help providing um, uh, testing when they returned uh, in January uh, 2021. One thing we did was create a contacts list um, and we were able to connect people like we've never been able to do before. Everyone started to know who each other were, what local charities they were, and that local parts of national charities like Red Cross, St. John, Salvation Army were able to link in with existing local charities, mostly uh, called Community Action. So Bradford Community Action could connect with the local organisation of Red Cross. That had never been done before in a crisis situation, and that was a massive change for the sector. We also created a proper network. So on a, on a weekly basis, the charities come together and they've moved on from just being a what's happening and how do we react to it now to being an informative uh, process. In uh, Every Thursday, 
morning, there is a, a short session of about an hour where different aspects of the voluntary and community sector come together and describe what they do, describe the contents of the, the uh, of their capabilities and um, uh, are able to share information and share ideas. And we're also able now to see movement of people across different charities, which again is, is, is quite refreshing. The request for support system is up and running um, so that it can be used now. Uh, if charities have got uh, uh, requests, they can put them in into the local uh, team and they're able to get that information out and, and get that assistance. But the sector now is also a hell of a lot more organised when it comes to campaigning. And I think this is such a strong legacy from COVID that there's things that the sector has been able to argue with um, uh, ministers uh, and with government particularly in order to get them working. And I think that in itself is a is a really good thing for um, uh, the sector. So in terms of where we are now, the sector has got less fraud because of the National Emergencies Trust and a much better understanding of how it can collect and it can distribute uh, finance. It's got two good brand names. Uh, the VCSEP and the NET are accepted amongst the uh, sector. Um, it's got better networking now for crisis. So we've had crises within crisis. So, for example, at Christmas, I spent many hours uh, trying to in, uh, trying to identify those that could provide food for the lorry drivers in Dover. And you remember that's not wasn't a um, a COVID. Uh, crisis. It, it was uh, uh, as a result of um, uh, Brexit. So there are crises that have occurred. Afghanistan recently, the, the VCSEP was massively involved in ensuring that um, charities work together, identify, uh, identifying need and getting support for them. It's also easier to access volunteers, um, and we'll probably discuss this a bit later, but I, I think this COVID has been the single biggest um, volunteering exercise since the Second World War, whether it's a street WhatsApp group, a Facebook group, um, or whether it's through a local church, a local charity, mosque, um, whether it's through Rotary, people have stood up to the plate and done everything possible, um, including um, at, at right at the beginning, making face coverings, right the way through to helping schools with testing, monitoring and marshalling at sites, or the jab army. So all of that has been a major movement of people. And I would say that that, that movement and that time volunteering has saved the country billions. Um, and I, I think just having been part of the organization of some of that has, uh, has, has I'm very proud of, of what's what's been achieved there and we've also streamlined the requests uh, for charities to get hold of funding because I think that's a really important aspect of this uh, that charities are able to get funding and support legally simply and effectively and that's been achieved so I just wanted to talk about a couple of the examples, and these are just some of the organisations involved. Um, school testing. In the two weeks after the uh, return from the Christmas break, I've estimated that uh, school testing by using volunteers has probably saved in the region of £24 million. If you take the minimum wage and then take the amount of hours worked by volunteers, to help um, young children to go back to school, add that up, it probably comes to about £24 million saving. That's money that the state would have had to have spent. Khalsa Aid and um, Muslim Charities Forum, both of which provided immense assistance to the lorry drivers in Dover, uh, right up and over Christmas. Incredible support. MCF, the Muslim Charities Forum, has been uh, on the case for just about every crisis over um, uh, COVID, um, including where there's been flooding, uh, they've got people involved. Halfway through this exercise, and, and probably relevant to some, um, we had discussions with NARPO 
And where there were requests for volunteers, we were able to put them out to the local NARPO reps, uh, the National Association of Retired Police Officers, and make sure that they were um, provided for. And we had lots of uh, lots of good work from that. Although NARPO does already work with local authorities in many areas of the country providing assistance. Uh, the JAB Army um, provoked, supported and enhanced by St John Ambulance, who did a, a brilliant job there. Salvation Army providing rooms, accommodation and, and a whole range of stuff over the over the um, uh, COVID period and, and Red Cross helping to provide leadership and direction. The CEO of Red Cross, Mike Adamson, um, basically put his, his principles before his own organisation to ensure that Red Cross was committed to supporting uh, the voluntary sector partnership. NAFCA, um, uh, National Association of Voluntary and uh, Community Action uh, Groups within, found in most towns and cities, uh, they provided people to act as what we, what we called liaison leads in order to ensure that local charities were represented and had a voice when it came to making strategic decisions. Um, there was some uh, concern right at the beginning that this would just be, everything would be taken over by British Red Cross. They didn't do that. This is the first time that we've had national charities, local charities uh, working together in order to try and ensure uh, that the needs of people are met. Um, there's a whole host of activity that's taken place, but what, I, what I'm really pleased about is that the charity itself has changed, um, has now got a structure and is now capable of looking after itself um, with a little bit of government help, although I may maybe in some of the questioning might come to uh, some of those because I've been showing the slide in this way. I haven't seen the questions, so I'm going to take the slides down. Okay, have we got any questions? Stuart, can we just um, talk about VSEP in relation to the local resilience forum frameworks and how did you coordinate the activity of the charities with what was already being organised at local government level for communities? Yes, and just yeah, I've got two. Can people just check their microphones, please, and just make sure that they're to mute? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I, the, the national structure, uh, local resilience for, for uh, forums for England and Wales um, and similar but uh, slightly different named in Northern Ireland and Scotland. One of the, the, the biggest problem is actually understanding where the voluntary sector fits in, because although they're all based on the same um, uh, Civil Contingencies Act structure, they differ across the country. And, and one of the things that we have done uh, twice now, once in 2019 and once during COVID, is to plot out who's on which LRF um, and understand whether we've got a, a proper voluntary sector representation uh, within each local resilience for it. That has been quite a challenge, um, and not least of all because they are all all differently run, um, but I'm glad to say um, that wherever charities have engaged, we've been able to provide people to support them. Um, at the moment, the Red Cross itself is is going through a sort of a check of, of what its relationship is like, because I think sometimes there and other organisations reps have turned up believing that they're representing their brand I, you know, what's on their shirt, um, rather than representing the sector. And we've done a lot of work to try and get people to understand that they're there to represent the sector. Um, whilst many organisations can provide a lot of facilities working together, the sector can provide a tremendous amount of support. And that's what we're trying to encourage. So just in terms of managing skills and training, I know this was a conversation we had last year around how that might be managed when you've got volunteers that might need some 
sort of particular training. How was that resolved in the end? Um, we've we've done a, a, a couple of exercises. We ran some uh, really good tabletop exercise. Well, not table desk. Uh, yeah, Zoom top exercises across the country. Uh, again, many people who have never met um, taking different parts with different scenarios, whether it's flooding or terrorist attack, um, and given uh, charities an opportunity to see what they would do, even though they're already in the middle of a crisis. And that's been really powerful in helping um, charities to under and, and particularly charity leaders to understand um, exactly how they should respond and how they can work better together um, with other charities. Thank you. And just one more question before we move to the panel. Um, in your article for Policing Insight before this um, workshop, you mentioned that the National Emergencies Trust was independent, um, but the government match funded that initial amount of money that was raised. Was that a one-off payment? And if not, does that impinge the independence of the NET? Um, I, I can guarantee um, Richard Danner, as a previous head of the army, is an exceedingly independent person. Um, he would not allow the, the um, uh, government to dictate what they do. It is completely independent. All the um, uh, board directors have been through a meticulous um, selection process. Uh, they are completely independent from government uh, and, and are accountable for, for how they run things. They've got an exceedingly diverse group of people from all walks of life. And having worked with them on exercises, um, they are very, very uh, intellectually sound people that understand both the sector and how to raise money and spend it properly. Government quite often provides um, uh, match funding for a whole range of different things. Um, for example, um, most of the, the large um, you know, TV events that are charity based are usually matched funds, funding sports relief, that sort of stuff. Um, so it's not uncommon. And they don't do it on the basis that, right, we want you to just turn around and, um, you know, say how good the minister is i don't i don't think lord Dannett's going to do that and he's got ceo uh vari who is um i think could kill you with a spoon she's uh ex-military and a, a very very powerful individual okay uh just before we move on to the panel i'd just like to come to a, a question from james uh, sorry, from Neil, Neil James. I'm interested to know what arrangements are being considered in coordinating and conducting structured debriefs to garner the learning from the responses. Uh, there's, there's, there's actually been quite a few sessions that have been run. We have some amazing facilitators. We've used all sorts of different tools. Um, Miro, uh, we've had a uh, about halfway through, uh, we, we used the Hydra Suite. Um, which is uh, done virtually, um, and that was that was uh, that was uh, really really powerful. Um, the the one thing the charity sector is 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 open to being told it could have done better, um, and there there are lots of structured debriefs that have been undertaken already, and I'm absolutely certain that they will be planning um, one to coincide with um, the public review next year. Lovely. Hopefully that answers your question, Neil. Um, brilliant. Stuart, thank you. That was absolutely superb. And I think mobilising the power of kindness is a hugely apt title for that presentation. Um, absolutely brilliant. So we're going to come on to uh, a panel session now where we just want to work through some questions that really are at the very core of all the workshops that we're putting on. and take us into the conference that we're holding on the 23rd of November, which is very much focused on where we're going next, you know, the lessons learned and what the, what this means for policing and how we're going to police and the models of policing moving forward. Um, so I would very much, obviously Hannah and Stuart will be sharing their thoughts on some of these questions, but if anybody um, in the audience has a view or a thought, then either pop your comments in the chat or raise your hand and, and participate in this next half hour. Very much welcome people's uh, 
views and opinions and, and thoughts on this. So be before we just look at those questions, um, it would be rude not to ask for your thoughts on the report that was issued today um, by the Health and Social Care Committee, which obviously did in its initial findings was quite scathing about some of the aspects of, of the response and made some particular comments about preparedness. Um, I'm just interested to know what, what you both think about that in, in an initial thoughts. Hannah, do you want to start? Um, yes, I will start. Uh, thank you. Um, I think what was interesting for me is that it didn't, hasn't really touched on the issue of PPE, which I think maybe it skirted around it on purpose because it has been such a sort of hot topic in the media um, from the perspective of trying to, to get PPE into the NHS and care homes. So maybe they considered that too big a topic that would detract from, from the other issues. Um, but I think I think it I think it should have been mentioned um, definitely. Um, you know we've we had to give we've been giving PPE to the to the National Health Service from policing when they've been in in difficulties. So um, and you know and, and luckily we haven't had any adverse uh, media reports on PPE at all um, in policing. Um, but I think I think that needed to be addressed. But I think one of one of the key points for me was that. Um, that the, the point was made that the civil contingencies um, sort of portfolio within the within the government was uh, was inadequate and they'd actually removed um, some of the specialist skills and knowledge from it. Um, and we all know that, you know, we need to plan for contingencies and we've got risk. We've all got risk registers and and we know we need to plan for these things. But to have a civil contingencies um, department in all but name is 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 not good enough really because they need they need it to step up and and have a plan for a lot of this stuff particularly PPE um, they needed to have a plan for, for where all this all this kit was so that for me is um, was quite a quite a stark finding. Stuart, um, I think it's 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 essentially a Westminster bubble view of the world. Um, it, it, I don't think that it's it it, it touches the, the issues for from the voluntary sector at all. Um, it makes comments of, uh, which are sort of sound bites. So we need this list of volunteers that that we will we will use. Um, totally unachievable in my view on the basis of what's happened in COVID. NHS volunteers were shown up, and in, in the in the document it talks about how um, how many people they had signed up. That was all very well and good, but the vast majority of people who volunteered and and, and gave up their time and energy to help their neighbours or their local community did so not because they were NHS volunteers. They did it because somebody who needed it asked, or the local um, surgery said we need people to marshal so we can jab people or schools said we need people to help out so that we can um, uh, test kids to get them back to school. Uh, it's locally based and I think this idea of this huge database of willing volunteers that's suddenly going to down tools and do stuff because the government says so uh, is nonsense. Uh, it's just it's just a shame that they they really miss the point on on the huge amount of activity and volunteer on volunteering didn't even mention um, National Emergencies Trust or VCSEP, despite the fact that NET raised 100 million mm -hmm. and VCSEP had, had basically helped coordinate an enormous amount of support. So I, I, I just think it's a it's an internal um, uh, Westminster bubble view of the world. Um, and I just can't wait for the public uh, review next year. OK, thank you. There was one comment um, in it where Oliver Letwin was quoted as saying the pressure to do, and this is talking about the government's um, structure for, for dealing with this, the, the pressure to deal with real problems that are current is overwhelming. The result is that too little attention is paid in every area to building appropriate insurance policies against things that are uncertain and working hard enough to identify all the things that might hit us and all the flexibilities and resilience we need to deal with them. And I suppose that goes to the core of this workshop in the sense of you know firefighting the now and not looking ahead to what's coming and not being prepared properly for that eventuality. That's yeah I mean that was an interesting point you made wasn't it because everything that we currently do now should be based on learning the lessons of the past 
and and building on that and using best practice and really you you know informing all our current work which we are busy with but with with learning um so i, I don't follow his train of thought here. yes everyone's very very busy but as in the case of covid everyone has to down tools of what they were doing you know and, and do other things sometimes you know attention has to be paid and i think that's where this whole lack of focus on the civil contingencies um department they would have been looking at this and making sure that this work was being undertaken so that's where it's fallen short can i just pick up a point um, mike has raised about jessup uh, i mean we used the training exercises and we conducted uh, three different series of those um over during covid um and used uh, jessup and introduced charities to the Jessup principles or protocols. Many, many charities have very little experience of dealing with um, local resilience forum and the language of response. Um, so it, 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 there is a there is a training need there to, to get them to understand it um, uh, sufficiently that they can appreciate how they can help out. So yeah, Mike, you make a good point there. That's interesting, actually. So I just wanted to pick up on something you said there, Stuart, about language. Uh, and that was one of the things that I learned very quickly when I started working with lots of external stakeholders and things. Um, acronyms in some organisations mean completely different things to what they do in policing. I mean, we use a lot of acronyms in policing, but they're they're everywhere. So it's um, it's overcoming the different languages in different organisations and never assuming that people in meetings or Zoom calls, you know, know what you're what you're talking about <laughs> when you're abbreviating things. I completely agree. My first um, tactical ad, uh, committee in Red Cross that I sat in on for the north of England, um, about halfway through, I was sending messages. What does that mean? What's a, what's an IL? Where do where do they live? What who do they you know what do they work for? So yeah, the police are not the um, I don't have the exclusive rights to uh, mnemonics and stuff, so and acronyms. Uh, all organisations have that, and all organisations create their own weather as well. We we didn't touch upon some of the. I know you you mentioned some of the the challenges of organisation or within organisations where they don't actually work together very well. The charity sector can be uh, uh, and was with two particular charities um, quite antagonistic. That time, and I know we we just assume if anybody works for a charity that they're all lovely people and they love everyone. Um, actually, when you put your brand first, that means you're putting everybody else second, and that in itself, particularly if you've come from different cultures, if you come from say a social care culture or you've come from a, a high end military culture, mm -hmm. um, the chances are that those differences might manifest them, themselves in terms of antagonism between the two organisations. Uh, and that, that that we did have several of those. I won't name names or go into details because that would be unfair. But um, just to assume that the voluntary sector would just come together and all work, playing you know, go in the playground and play nicely, that isn't happening. Um, we do have occasionally um, little tantrums and um, people throwing things around. Not literally, obviously. <laughs> Mike, did you want to come back um, in regard to your question about Chesset before we move on? You're on mute. You're on mute yeah, I'm there now. As you know, I'm in the middle of uh, organising a motorsport event and trying uh, the language, talking the language of um, safety people um, and different organisations we're interacting with. It's, uh, it's very interesting. I'm also trying to persuade Motorsport UK to follow the Jessup principles um, rather than um, so that we can work with uh, other organisations. Uh, and thanks, thanks very much. Uh, um, and nice to see you again, Hannah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, so if we can, uh, thank you, Mike. That's brilliant. Cheers. Um, so let's just move on to some of these core questions that are, are really at the the heart of our our workshops and the conference. Um, in respect to the pandemic, obviously some parts of our communities have been disproportionately affected. Um, 
more so than than others. How, from your respective um, viewpoints, can we reach those minority groups that traditionally have been harder to hear? How do we reach out to those with some of the issues that have, they've been affected by in the last 18 months? Um, I'm happy to go first, if that's all right, Stuart. Um, of course. So this this is something that has been bothering me or bothers me all the time, but bo has bothered me throughout the pandemic um, when it became clear that um, our colleagues, um, you know, members of the community um, who are black and minority ethnic were disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, how do we how do we reach out to those people to reassure them? Um, masks, uh, police officers wearing masks are an, are an immediate barrier. Uh, and there were there were real issues around communication um, and raising concerns um, in policing around communication uh, when we first sort of started wearing PPE. And, and also how we how we reach out to our own our own colleagues within our own organisations to to reassure them that you know that we we're, we're aware of, of of the issues that are affecting them and how and how we want to help them. Um, part of the the research I commissioned from Cardiff University was what more could we be doing to help protect our colleagues and communities? What sort of PPE should we be you know looking to procure? What are the barriers for people? Um, what communication should we be using? Um, so Cardiff ran a series of focus groups with all different people within the organisation, but specifically uh, ran some focus groups. My request with our, with our um, black minority ethnic colleagues and also female colleagues to understand um, in a safe environment whether they felt supported or whether they felt um, unduly um, pressed, you know, at work or felt isolated or, or had issues. Um, with with trying to understand working in a COVID climate. Um, so I mean, it's just really important to continue those conversations with people once you once you've say reached out to people that, that are harder to, to harder to hear is to keep those conversations going. So kept up those networks um, through the staff associations um, linked into the sort of police national wellbeing service to try and push out more information from them around enhanced risk assessments um, and just different, I suppose, trying to understand that, you know, the different ways that COVID's affected them, even to the point of, you know, trying to purchase PPE when all our um, masks are ear looped ones, try to purchase some head looped ones for, for, people, for people that wear turbans, you know, and, and hijabs. It's difficult for them, you know, to, to put these things to put these things on. It's not designed uh, for everyone, um, and you know, getting ear savers and things that that uh, that make that make wearing this this kit a bit easier, and um, issuing slightly higher uh, level of protection masks um, to some colleagues that with a risk assessment um, would require them. So. For me, I think there's all there's always work we can do, but I think we, we have tried really hard during the pandemic to to, to reach out to, to colleagues and also our communities by understanding as well how how much more difficult stop and search is when you're when you're trying to communicate with masks. Um, so wrote into part of the guidance that when officers stop and search somebody, they should be offering them a surgical mask that they can put on themselves um, to protect them from us, you know. Um, so it's just things like that that I think I think increasing that power of communication between people can only be a good thing. So to actually it almost lowers that the stress when you're doing a stop and search confrontation if you're if you're starting from that point where you're having to sort of lower your mask and you're offering someone else one. Um, you know that there's lots of different things that we can do to in, engage with people, and it's and it's using all these different. Um, all these different tools and just different ways of looking at things but i think definitely the pandemic has made has made people look at things more differently i think well i think my my example is on that same line the sort of ppe um right at the beginning um and this started actually locally in bradford we identified that there were a lot of people that were in need of face coverings um, just to protect themselves, you know, when going about their normal business, um, particularly those who are homeless, um, lead chaotic lifestyles, or um, perhaps are uh, sofa surfers, you know, they don't have a 
place of abode they move around um, and we wanted to ensure that they who were probably also more at risk of catching and spreading COVID than most of the population. Uh, so trying to identify a who they were, where they were, and um, work with various charities to, to get them, and then to provide them with um, face coverings. And that that in itself was quite a challenge. Um, although again, by using, using business in the community and a whole range of other organisations, we were able to get a supply to be able to meet that need. Um, but it, it just it, it just does go to show that that you can make huge assumptions about what a is available and and where it should go as as as, as you were doing, Hannah. Um, mm. But when you start thinking about well, who are the who are the most at risk? And they are the people living leading chaotic lifestyles, whether they're drugs users, alcohol users, or abusers, whether they're homeless um, or sofa surfers or people like that. And and it did open up a really good debate amongst the sector about one, how do you identify them? And secondly, is where can you get the stuff to give them? Uh, because if you provide a, a you know a single mask to somebody who, who is homeless, where do they keep it? How do they wash it? Um, you know, you, there's a, there's a there's a whole host of different issues that need to be resolved for that. Uh, I'm glad to say the sector did pull itself together and find some solutions. How does the sector link in with, for example, neighbourhood teams then that are actually dealing with those um, communities firsthand? How do they, how do you share information and link in so that you make sure that the need is identified and what services can be provided by the, the charity sector is is I can probably answer that from a very local basis. I, I live in um, Ilkley in uh, West Yorkshire, which is a beautiful city in God's country, um, or got a town in God's country. Um, I chaired the uh, uh, COVID group. So we had um, all of the charities involved, uh, Rotary, Roundtable, people like that. We had churches. We have a church together in um, Ilkley. We also had um, one of the local doctors representing the health service, local councillors and other people as well. And it was only through that, including um, a uh, police officer, one of the local uh, sergeants that would attend, that we were able to to link that in. To be fair, there were not many um, what I would call policing issues that um, the group had to discuss. There was one that involved both police and schools. Um, there was one that involved police and um, uh, activities near the riverside um, again that was all discussed through the uh, the group um, but it's a good example of just bringing the community together that has now transformed into what we call a community network now and is much wider than just covid um, but for, for most of 2020 and the first part of 2021 it was just a covid group um, and we had uh, like i said most agencies and groups within uh, the town. And that is replicated across the country. Lovely, thank you. Um, just to move on to the next question. Um, so looking forward then, what risks can we see coming? What do we think we can do about them in our respective worlds? Anna, do you want to? Uh, one of the biggest risks I think is the risk of just quickly moving on from this and not, uh, you know, just because we do move on from things quickly um, and not embedding the learning and actually reform, properly reforming um, policing with some of the things that we've learned. Um, it's a risk, I think. I mean, we are doing lots of work. We actually set up a reform and recovery strand um, the day the pandemic started because we knew that it would be harder to go back and recover bits of work that had worked really well and then um, try and collate them all. So we've been sort of working hard to try and do that, gather all the information along. Um, we've done sort of hydro events, um, like you mentioned earlier, Stuart, sort of the 10,000 volt event where we got about 500 people in that had, that had been heavily involved in the pandemic to, to feed back the changes and things. Um, they did highlight 
a lot of risks there. There was there were risks around, um, say, interacting, I suppose, with, with government, with with policing getting quite political. Um, that that was a risk. Um, probably not not inadvertently, but not taking care of our, our officers well enough. You know, their welfare, trying to give them PPE and everything, but you know, the fact that policing then weren't pro prioritised for vaccination. Um, you know, the testing testing wasn't wasn't um wasn't rolled out fully either track and trace you know these are these are things that haven't worked well so we need to i think the risk is we need to we need to bring policing with us we need to to make sure that we uh, communicate the learning that's taken place and in, and embed it say fully for the future um, but tell people what we're doing constantly i think in policing we're not very good at telling people what we're doing so they people assume nothing's happening um so that for me, that for me is a, um, one of the risks. Another risk um, that Public Health England have flagged up is that we are way overdue a, a flu pandemic, <laughs> um, and people think that this COVID pandemic is our kind of flu and flu pandemic, and we've sorted it. But actually, we are we're historically we're due one, um, and we've had very fallow couple of years because nobody's been out and about, and we've been covered up and sanitised. So. Um, that for me is a concern when people are are relaxing, thinking COVID's not so much of an issue that they are going to to, to catch the flu. Um, but that that for me, I think, is a risk, and that's why I'm, you know, we're embedding it within the civil contingencies portfolio within policing around it being very high on the risk register, so that we do that testing and with with Stuart's um, with Stuart's help and with the voluntary sector, we include them in all our our tabletop exercises, our virtual exercises. Um, you know, we need to build in. The things that we've learned. I, I think the, the National Risk Register gives a big indication and clue as to what's likely to come and, and the yeah, flu um, pandemic, if we can call it that, uh, plus um, uh, cyber attack are the sort of the, the, the very risk areas. But going back to your first point, Hannah, about, you know, are we moving on too quickly? That's what I fear from government. A uh, decision they made last week which was to uh, we've we've had excellent relationships with the charities minister uh, aptly named Baroness Barron, um, who has been working uh, tirelessly for um, uh, the sector over this this last 18 months. That post is now going to be swamped into uh, something else in the sports section of DCMS, uh, and it's going to run alongside um, the Commonwealth Games minister that's going to be running that so it, it's been watered down and i think that's a that's a massive shame because it means that the voluntary sector itself charities don't have somebody who will speak specifically on their behalf um i i really don't understand the reasoning behind that um but it's a clear indication that that you know we move on charities themselves um hopefully will will not just ignore where they are. I think we've made major changes. I just hope that we can keep it going. OK, thank you. Can I just come back to Hannah's point um, about lessons learned and the National Police Coordination Centre really its role and its remit was stepped up hugely during the pandemic to actually start data collection from across the forces and, and others in order to steer MPCC and Home Office decisions and responses and I wonder Hannah is that likely to go backwards or is that something that is here to stay so that that oversight is maintained going forward and and if in the case of a, a, a seriously bad winter where the flu does affect sickness levels across policing and it's something that needs to be monitored is that something that's going to be in place or will we be stepping it up again you know yeah, well, if I have anything to do with it, um, it it will remain as is, and that's that's actually a piece of work that I'm working on at the moment, because with all these things, we we brought in a mechanism to to collect um, absence and sickness data, so that we could get down to granular detail about uh, whether people in forces were self isolating, whether they were off sick, whether they're off sick with COVID or off sick with something else. So we actually have got really good data. Um, on sickness, which we're collecting on a daily basis at the moment, because sickness did start to rise, and um, we had gone back to weekly. Um, but 
it, it costs money to have this um, to have this sort of method of, of sickness collection, absence collection in place. So we're just we're just looking at um, affordability or other options. I mean, it is a it is a stress on forces that are already stretched to to provide us with data. But actually, for me, that that sickness absence data is is um is imperative. I think and actually it, at the moment it's playing into how we're managing um, and staffing um, COP26 in Scotland. I mean, that's a continually shifting picture at the moment. We're shifting, so, you know, we're going to be moving seven and a half thousand COPs up to Scotland. Um, and we have to look at absence rates in each of those departments of those specialist posts. So to have that really fine detail on a daily basis is absolutely crucial. Um, but it, it's, it's the same for protest, you know, all sorts of things. We, we know which forces we can tap into dependent on where they are and with their absence levels. For me, that's it's really important. And I know that the minute we take our eye off the ball and we don't ask forces for it, you know, someone in government will go, oh, you know, what's the sickness rate today? And then we'll have to do an ad hoc request of forces, which will be more burdensome on them. So I'm just trying to look at whether we can make make things easier and digitise it. And again, with, with uh, crime reporting, we've really got some, some excellent information now on domestic abuse, stalking and harassment, um, cyber crime, all sorts of things that we, we didn't have that really good detail on, but actually we've taken the, the time and the care to, to get forces to set up methods for getting that data to us. So we are working with um, working with government and working with MPCC to try and make that a, a continuation, um, but as sort of least burdens and to forces as, as we can make it. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to trust and confidence in police. Um, big issue at the minute, probably at an all time low. Stuart, how do we build trust and confidence in this very difficult time? Oof, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? I, I think uh, for me, I, I, I don't I haven't lost my trust and confidence in policing. Um, and people would say, yeah, that's because you've got a pension, so you, you shouldn't do that. No, I, I, I think this is about the amount of media attention that we're getting at the moment and most of it being negative. I mean, I was reading an article this morning about an officer off duty that arrested a, a, a robber who was armed and had to detain people until the, his colleagues could arrive. Um, and it was a very brave act. It isn't even going to get page 18 of the Express uh, in a small section. It's just going to be ignored by the media. Um, but had the officer, um, you know, caused any damage to the individual, it would have been um, splashed all over the front page. So I, I think that the, the media does have a little bit to answer to this. Um, but I think it's also about police leaders standing up. Um, I know, I've, you know, some some people have been calling for uh, Cressida to go. Um, I've known her for 30 odd years. I think she is one of the most professional people I've ever come across. She has followership. She is an absolute leader um, and she is the, the most polite, restrained and dedicated uh, police officer I've ever worked with. Um, and I think at the moment that the Met does need her. Um, whether that that does work or not, I don't know. Um, I think just getting rid of people because it, you know, it's something to do is not the answer. The answer must be much more holistic. Um, the issues around the way in which uh, police uh, deal with um, victims, yes, that can always be improved. But if you take 20 percent out of the budget of an organisation and add to the amount of work that they've got to do, and add to the expectation and accountability, and add that everything else, everybody else can can um, sit and moan about them. It's not surprising that 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 um, people will lose trust in, and confidence in policing, as they do in in health, in education, and everything else that has faced the same problems. You know, you look at faith and confidence in in or trust and confidence in local authorities. It's dreadful. Um, uh, so I I think um, yeah we've got to do a bit ourselves but most importantly police leaders have got to stand up and say something uh, and uh, be accountable 
Yeah, no, I, I, I echo what you say. I mean, I'm, so I'm a Met officer and I, you know, I, I feel shocked and ashamed of, you know, what's taken place, uh, as, you know, as a, as a human being and, you know, and it's, it's, but it's down to all of us to, to sort of re-engage and build that trust with communities and with, with everyone we meet. And I think what has been positive about the pandemic is actually our four E's approach. Um, so the engage, explain, encourage and enforce is the last resort. So I think that that mantra, if we embed it in all our communications, I mean, I've I've embedded it in the way I the way I engage with everyone when I have to speak to them, you know, try and engage with people, make sure they they understand what you're trying to, to tell them, um, explain to them, you know, encourage um, encourage sort of uptake of um, you know wearing PPE or communication or you know things people don't want to do. Um, we really have to be, I suppose, I don't know, warmer, warmer and, and kinder in our approach and realise that actually people ha people are conflicted now when they approach police officers in a way that they weren't before because of what the media have, have put into people's heads and especially we need to engage with young people. Um, you know, just speaking to my daughter about, you know, about the whole whole case, she said, well, I'm not sure I trust all officers, police officers. I trust you because you're my mum. I'm like, well, no, you should trust, you should trust everyone. Um, and she said, well, we do talk about it at school, you know, and lots of people have lost trust. So I think this is where we need to really get into schools. You know, police need to go in and be that that face and, and be that leadership that people need um, and explain our role all over again, really. It's interesting you mentioned about the four E's uh, workshop last year. We were had the benefit of Assistant Commissioner Richard Chambers from the New Zealand Police talking about their approach in the pandemic, and it was extremely similar, um, extremely similar to mm -hmm. ours, and very successful. I think one of the issues arising from the pandemic in terms of policing was the difference in the way that the guidance was perceived to be being implemented up and down the country, and I think that was an issue. And I wonder what. As somebody trying to roll out guidance in a in a very in a crisis for various different things, how do you make sure that it's uh, fully understood and and exercised in a way that is consistent across different forces? Yeah, I mean that that's been the, the challenge throughout. It's um you know guidance and regulations are very different. I can write guidance and offer guidance to forces, but they can choose not to follow it. But if there isn't guidance there then they will ask for it if only to disagree with it when it arrives as long as the, as long as there's something in place um but the, you know the guidance is there um to be followed or not um but it's explaining the rationale behind it it's, it's explaining to people that it isn't just me making things up it's it's been informed it's evidence-led it's scientifically based it's um you know public health england have been involved you know sage you know we speak to all, you know, the scientists to make sure everything's, you know, fully, you know, fully up to date. And I think that's where we've got to go in policing is rather than be very prescriptive and say, you know, do as I do. I mean, there's there's obviously cases when that's needed in protest environments and public order. But actually, the rest of the time, we need to take the time to explain why we're doing something or the rationale for it. And very often people don't understand that. And they don't didn't during the pandemic understand the difference between um, guidance and, and regulations and the fact that we couldn't enforce guidance but we could enforce regulations and that you know and it was that was very difficult territory for policing to be in um, so that's why it needed that 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 four E's approach to yeah lovely thank you Hannah um, we are just coming to the last bit aren't we of, of the workshops we have just one more question to consider and we do have one or two international guests in the audience who I'd be interested to know their thoughts on this if they want to share but Stuart just starting with you what do the police across the world need to do to prepare for the next 12 months do you think very big question I get <laughs> Why are you asking me the big question? I, I, I think coming back to what Hannah said earlier about those risks 
um, they're there. The National Risk Register shows them, and those those there's nothing unique about our risk register that doesn't apply elsewhere. You know, it's 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 cyber, it's flooding, um, or climate crisis. Um, you only see the you know looking at the chaos that's uh, in in La Palma at the moment. That that uh, okay, it's a it's a series of earthquakes and a volcano could cause horrendous um, damage. Um, not just locally, but uh, uh, across the whole of the the Atlantic coast. Um, and if you look at um, cyber, we, we've seen this time and time again. The, uh, we've also got the, you know, the gas pipelines um, that have either are stopped or encouraged. Plus, you've got one or two countries that that are playing around with huge weaponry. So I think there's there's a, there's a a large number of risks. And I would say to any um police force in the world you've got to keep ahead of that you've got to know what those risks are uh, to your nation um because they will be risks for all nations and look at how you can deal with them i, I mean I've had, I've had the privilege to be able to work with police forces um in fact i've worked with the uh, uh, saps and i see we've got somebody from saps on here uh, absolutely incredible group of of individuals um i've and, and police forces across the globe, people join because of the same sort of reason. Uh, it's a good career and they want to do good. Um, clearly, there are some that don't fit that category, but the vast majority do in every country that I've visited, whether it's China, Pakistan, um, uh, South Africa, countries in North Africa, the Middle East, America, Canada, Brazil. Uh, they generally join because they want to do good. And I think it's up to senior leadership to make sure that they carry on doing good, but also prepare them for the next crisis. Lovely. Anna, closing comments? Yeah, I would I would just say that I think I think every every police force, as, as Stuart said, is, is facing these same sort of sort of global issues. But I would say that one of the things I've learned is that we really have to be involved at the start at the highest levels of of those conversations because actually policing policing is good in a crisis we are good in a crisis we know what to do um, and as a, as a result of of covid you know lots more work has been coming into to mpoc where i am all sorts of different things and people generally just asking for advice so we need to we need to make sure that we're actually at the sharp end where where you know serious decisions are being made so that we can work out where we need to position ourselves as police, and not just be sort of contacted after the event or say, you know, can you help us out? Because we need, we are involved in all these things, whether we whether we like it or not. You know, even if it's nothing to do with us, we will be facilitating, you know, the fire service to get to deal with floods. You know, we'll be we'll be facilitating, you know, um, protesters to to protest and thing. We facilitate things and do things that don't necessarily fall in the traditional policing bracket but we need to be you know really involved in 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 when guidance is 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 written to inform whether to inform whether or not we can actually respond to and 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 deal with the guidance whether it translates onto the ground where it's supposed to, where it's supposed to land so yeah for me i think that's that's one of the benefits of of now having our sort of chief national you know police scientific science officer scientific officer and also our our national chief medical officer. I think having people at, at that level that are that connected takes a bit of the heat off of the other chiefs, but they can then they can then send those messages to the chiefs about about what's happening and what's around the corner and what they need to be prepared for. Can I just one final comment on that? Um, I haven't been to any police force in the in the world um, in talking to to cops or others that I haven't learned something. Or come away thinking that's a damn good way of doing things, um, or good practice. So look around, look at look at look at other forces, look at other countries about what they're doing and why they're doing it, um, because I think there's there's lots to learn. Um, and uh, yeah, just just that's if there's one piece of advice, look globally. Um, we are so well connected now; it's it's far easier to do that than than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago.
Brilliant. I'll draw it draw it to a close there and just say a huge thank you both for your candor in that panel meeting. And hand back to Bob, please. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for your expert moderation there and the effort that you put into getting this evening together. Um, huge thanks to both Hannah and, and Stuart there for some fascinating insights from two people who've really been at the heart of you know a, a really challenging year. And it's been a challenge, you know, for everybody this last 18 months, not just in the UK but across the world. And I know at the moment there's some debate in the UK about do we trust the police and so on. But if you just look at the way that the police service, in particular, with others of course, have stood up to and put themselves at risk, but protected us, the public. Certainly, I think for everybody I know that that trust, you know, is it may have been dented, but it is still very much there. Uh, so I'm hugely grateful for for Hannah as a serving officer and Stuart for using his expertise in the background, which is what makes this you know, really so special. And, and I'm delighted, you know, for, for the, the turn up, the number of people that have, have listened in this evening and, and put some fantastic questions in. So huge thanks to everybody there. Um, we have another session on Thursday, um, International Preparedness, which should be really interesting, Patrick Vengler. And I'm delighted to, delighted to say that both Hannah and Stuart will be joining us on the 23rd of November for the London Policing College Conference at the University of West London, which will also be live on air, so you can join uh, in exactly the same way you've joined today. So look out for details on the London Policing College website. So Hannah, Stuart, Karen, thank you all so much for, for a fascinating evening. Uh, huge thanks and good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.